So the one sample t-test, as I said before, is looking to see if the average score, the mean score on some kind of numeric variable, a quantitative variable, in the population from which this sample is drawn is significantly different to some other mean score on the variable. So remember that the process of, of devising a research question and gathering data from a sample is to try and find out information from the wider population from which the sample was drawn. So the research question is always about the wider population and that's why in this one sample t-test question we're talking about the average score on the variable in the population from which the sample was drawn. So is this average score different to some other external number, some other external mean score? And there's a few different ways that we could specifically think about this kind of question. In particular, to give you a couple of examples here, we could say that is the mean IQ score of university students different to the known general population mean IQ score of 100? So if we gather data from a sample of university students, data from on their particular IQ scores, then is the average score on those IQ tests, is that different to what we know that the average IQ score is in the wider population, not the population of university students, but the general population of people in general. We could also ask whether the prevalence of chronic back pain, say in Australia, in a new population, is different to some other population, say the prevalence in the USA. So we want to understand what the average um, what the average, say, number of people with chronic back pain is in Australia and whether that's different to the number of people that we know have chronic back pain in the USA. We could also ask whether the average score that statistics students get on a test is different to chance. So do students perform better than chance on a particular test. So let's say we had a whole a test which was made up of just true or false questions. So if people scored at chance for that test of true or false questions, then we would expect people to get an average score of 50% because if you've got two options, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting each particular question right. So does the average score for students, is that average score significantly different to what they would get if it was just due to, due to chance? So those are three specific kinds of research questions we could have where we're addressing a one sample t-test type question. And remember that what we're looking at here is a single variable. There's one variable that we're looking at, and that variable is a numeric variable, a quantitative variable. And we're looking at the average score on that variable. And we want to know if the average score in the population from which the sample was drawn is different to some other average score, some known average score, some external reference average score. We know that any time we're doing statistical tests, we have two kinds of statistical hypotheses, and those hypotheses are called a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. And remember that those are different to a research hypothesis, and if, that, if you're a little bit unsure about that, go back to the previous week's lectures, in particular last week when we were talking about that. In terms of the one sample t-test, we can express our null hypothesis, which is represented by H naught here. We can express the null hypothesis as being mu equals mu zero. And that's what's written out here. Remember mu is a Greek symbol which represents a population mean score. So the first mu here is, this, is the population mean score from the population from which our sample was drawn, the sample which are the people who gave us the data. And we're seeing if that average score is equal to our known external average, that test score that we're comparing our average score with. And that's represented by mu zero here. So that's our null hypothesis. Remember that the null hypothesis always says that there's no difference. So in this instance, the null hypothesis is saying that there's no difference in the mean score from our particular population, the population from which our sample was drawn, and the test value, the test score, the other external population that we're comparing our score against. Our alternate hypothesis takes the form of the opposite of the null hypothesis. So you can see here our alternate hypothesis, H1, is represented by mu not equal to 
mu zero. So equals with the dash through it means not equal to. So the alternate hypothesis here is saying that the average score on the population from which our sample was drawn is not equal to some known external population average, some other population average score. This probably seems a little bit conceptual at this stage, but hopefully it will make more sense when we actually start looking at an example on the next couple of slides. All right, so the next thing we need to need to talk about are assumptions. So I've mentioned assumptions a few different times, I think, thus far. And assumptions are just certain conditions that have to be met in order for the test that we're particularly talking about here to be valid, in order for it to be a sensible thing to conduct this particular test in this particular set of circumstances. So every kind of, st of statistical test that we're talking about has assumptions that go along with it. And assumptions just being the things that tell us whether this test is appropriate in this particular instance. For our one sample t-test, we have three assumptions. The first one is that the variable of interest, the variable that we're talking about here that we're dealing with, is on some kind of numeric scale, that it's a quantitative variable. That's the kind of variable that we have to have in order for a one sample t-test to be appropriate. We know that there's two different kinds of numeric variables we can have, an interval variable and a ratio variable. In this instance, it doesn't matter whether the variable is interval or ratio as long as it's a numeric variable, as long as it's not an ordinal variable or a nominal variable. The second assumption here is that the variable is normally distributed in the population from which the sample was drawn. Because the data that we've actually got is sample data, we don't have information on the entire population, then what we need to do in order to test this particular assumption, assumption two here, is to test the distribution of data in our sample and see if that distribution of data is, is approximately normal, is basically normal, is, is um, essentially normal. And we use that distribution to reflect what we think the distribution of the population data is. And the third assumption here is that our observations are independent. And what that means is that if we have an observation, a piece of information, a piece of data from each individual, that those people are all separate people, that we didn't sample one person twice, we don't have a, a double up um, or a repeated sample from the same person, that all of the people who gave us the data here are separate independent people. And the third assumption here is something that's met through the design of our study. That we know because we have information about how the study was designed, we can get information about whether our observations are independent or not, whether our people are separate people, are independent people or not. The other two assumptions, assumptions one and two, we can actually test by looking at the data, looking at the variables themselves. Okay, so each time we talk about a statistical test, we're going to use a particular research question, a particular research context, and each of these examples are taken from actual published papers in psychology, um, and the data sets and information about the data is available to you on iLearn. I've talked about it briefly um, previously, and I'll show you as we go throughout the examples here how you can access the data itself to have a look at it in Stata and to play around with it and to run the test yourselves. When we're going through each of the tests, I strongly, strongly recommend that you kind of um, play along at home, essentially. So you um, undertake the tests just like I'm undertaking them in the lectures, because this is the best way for you to learn what's actually happening and how to run these tests instead of yourself, which is a really important part of the course. Okay, so this particular research question, this particular experiment that we're using the data from here for this one sample t-test, the context is that it's in a developmental psychology experiment. And the particular research context is that it's looking at what social function music plays for infants. So it's kind of from an evolutionary psychology perspective, and it's looking to see what function music, particular familiar music, plays for infants, for little babies. The background to this research is that People think that people theorize that the melodies of songs, <clears throat> pardon me, can convey information, can communicate information about social affiliation. So the affiliation of people, kind of social groups, in groups. Um, and therefore, we think that familiar melodies who are sung by an unfamiliar person could signal to the infant that this unfamiliar, unfamiliar person is a member of the in-group. So that's the general background to this particular research question.
It's an experiment that the researchers undertook to give us the data um, that we've got here. And the particular research question that we're addressing for this particular example is wanting to know whether infants spend more time looking at an unfamiliar adult who's sung a familiar melody compared to an unfamiliar adult who's sung an unfamiliar melody. So the particular hypothesis here is that infants will spend more time looking at an adult who sings a familiar song, the familiar song adult, compared to an adult who sings an unfamiliar song. And we've got two variables that we're looking at here for two times that we can undertake this one sample t-test. The first time we undertake it, we'll be looking at the first variable, and then I'll give you um, the second variable here for you to practice just with another example yourself. So the key variable that we're looking at for this first example is the proportion of time that infants spend looking at one unfamiliar adult compared to another unfamiliar adult. And this is a baseline test before the adults sing the familiar versus the unfamiliar song, just to test to see whether there's any differences in the amount of time that infants spend looking at one adult versus the other one. That's the citation for the paper there. As I said before, um, the data comes from a, from a published study, a published psychology study. So you can look up the paper if you want to, to have a look at all the different kinds of research questions that they addressed in that paper. Okay, so the first variable that we're looking at for the first one sample t-test is the baseline proportion of gaze that the infant spent looking between two different adults. So essentially what we're achieving here is just to check before they actually start singing any of the songs, singing a familiar or an unfamiliar song, to check to see that there's no differences in terms of how much time the infant spend looking at each of the two adults. This is what the data look like. That's the particular variable that we're talking at here, the baseline proportion of gaze. Because this is a proportion variable, the numbers range from 0 to 1. And if we have a proportion of 0.5, that means that the infant spent equal amount of time looking between the two adults. The, the greater the number is above 0.5, the more they looked at one adult compared to the other one. And as I showed you a few weeks ago when we had our first data lecture, um, you can access this data set yourself. All you need to do is to type in these two commands into the Stata command line window, um, the web use set command and then the web use command pulling up the actual data. And you can do that and you can have a look at the data yourselves. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is just to summarize, to get an, a sense of the distribution of this particular variable. And we can use Stata's summarize command at the top here to get a table of descriptive statistics. And we can use the histogram command to get the actual graph down the bottom right hand corner, which is the histogram. So what you can see here is that we have 32 observations, observations from 32 different infants. The mean proportion of time they spent looking between the two adults is 0.52, which is pretty similar to 0.5. The standard deviation gives us a measure of variance around the mean. And the shortest amount of time and the longest amount of time in terms of the breakdown between the two adults ranges from 0.236 to 0.870. So you can see that between the 32 infants, there's quite a range in terms of their proportion of gaze. So what we're trying to achieve with this one sample t-test is to see if the average amount of time that the infant spent, which is the mean proportion of gaze here, whether that's significantly different to 0.5. One of the assumptions I said to you before of the one sample t-test is that the variable in the population from which the sample was drawn is normally distributed. And I said to you that the way that we test that because we don't have information from the entire population is to test the distribution of our sample data. And this is coming back to things we talked about a few weeks ago in terms of the five different elements or the five different attributes of a normal distribution. That a distribution has to have central tendency, variability, has to be unimodal, it has to be approximately symmetric and mesocodic. So what we can do in this instance is to have a look at our histogram and to see if it looks approximately normal or not. We talked in, in the um, summarizing data lecture about a few different ways, a few different measures that we can pull out in terms of numbers to assess the normality of a distribution. I'm not going to go through all of those again now just because it would take too much time away from what we're trying to achieve this lecture. But all of the things we talked about there can be applied in this instance in terms of assessing if this distribution is normal or not. So what we can see here looking at the histogram is that, yes, it does have central tendency. 
It definitely does have variability. It's unimodal in that there's only one peak. It's approximately symmetric. It's a little bit positively skewed and it's got, it's got a bit more of a tail up the right hand side than the left hand side, but it's approximately symmetrical and it's mesocurtic. It's not too, too pointy and it's not too flat. So it does meet all those five attributes or those five elements for a normal distribution. So we can say that, yes, we are satisfied at the stage that our data are normally distributed, that in the population from which the sample was drawn, assuming that the sample is representative of the population, which is always what we assume it is, then we can say that the distribution of the variable is approximately normal. So going back to our three assumptions, we know that our variable is on a numeric scale, that it's a numeric variable because the variable is representing something that's inherently a number. We know that the variable is normally distributed because we just checked the distribution of the sample data itself. And we know through the sampling design of the study that our observations are independent. And that means that we can proceed now to the actual hypothesis testing procedure.